It's a really important concept for people to understand when they're struggling to work out the nuances of, you know, this battle that's unfolding that has been going on for the last 75 years. There was not a single day where the Arab nation said, let's try and coexist. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality we need to accept. And the Muslim and Arabic world needs to accept that. We never pursued peace, to be fair, because they declared independence from the British mandate in 1948. Right. And the very next day, war was declared. There was no day in between the 14th and the 15th where they said, is there another way we can go? Now, they lost that war. 1967, the yep. Six-Day War, they lost that war. The Yom Kippur War, 1973, yep. they lost that war. They kept losing wars. But remember, on a shame culture, well, we got to win. And we're going to sacrifice the future of our children. We're going to sacrifice our sons and our daughters to martyr them because we need to fill the position of honour. We're, we're doing a podcast today with Nate Buzz, that's his that's his nickname. Social media name, yeah. Nathaniel Bazolich is the official title, but Nate Buzz is the easiest thing for people to say. Okay, because that's, that's the way I can say it. I can't even pronounce your last name, but to me this is a very, uh, one of the most, if not the most important podcast that I've done. Uh, Nate has been extremely vocal on social media and otherwise talking right now about what's happening, of course, between Israel, Palestine, Gaza, and it is beyond a pleasure to have this conversation with you. I mean it. So thank you so much for making the time. That's the first thing. Second thing is I want you to explain, because you're not, you're not Jewish. No. So why do you care about Israel so much? Yeah, well, look, I'll, I'll be completely honest with your audience. I, I'm, I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm a believer that Jesus is the, you know, the promised Messiah. My, my love for Israel is through a, a deep understanding of what the Torah and the Tanakh has presented. Um, and, and what comes from that is a very, very clear understanding of this covenant relationship that God has forged with this nation known as Israel, which was for 2000 years kind of hidden in, you know, and dispensed throughout the world. And everything changes in 1948 when, when God keeps his promise a promise that was made to Abraham, you know, some 4,000 years earlier. And God made a declaration to the world on the 14th of May, 1948, that my covenant with Israel, my promise to my friend, he refers to Abraham as his friend in the Torah, um, stands and it still stands today. And so I, I looked at that moment um, for us who are living in a generation that can see God's fulfillment alive today as one of the most important and crucial pieces of the greater puzzle of God's story. Uh, as, a, as a Christian, I see what's unfolding and I have a simple obligation, which is to glorify God. That's my task. Yeah. And m misinformation, lies, you know, the, the, the pattern of hate towards the Jewish people cannot be denied based on history alone. And so now that we're moving back into a generation where that is all being rebirthed, uh, myself as a Christian and every single other Christian who may tune into this conversation, there's no sitting in the middle. There's God's story and there's those who are strictly against the truth of what God is doing. And for me as a Christian, it's, it's quite simple. God has a heart for the nation of Israel. He brought them back into the land and now the world wants to stamp that out. There's nowhere a Christian can stand. And then that's one of the realities that I realized quickly um, after I had a very, very, very deep encounter with God, which actually took place in Iraq, which is a strange place to have an encounter with God. But I can give you that story in some, some basic detail if you're interested in I'm hearing that. I'm very interested because my other question, my next question was going to be, were you always like this? Yeah, no. Um, so I became a Christian at 27. Um, what, did, how did you, what did you grow up as? Uh, you know, I would say I believed in an, a God or okay. God, um, you know, but I had no personal understanding or connection with that God. And I think that's really, really important for people to understand. There's a huge difference between people believing that there is a God and people believing in the one true God and knowing him. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a difference between believing something exists and knowing something exists. And so I became a Christian at 27, and I would say I, I, I fumbled through my understanding of what Christianity was, um, you know, becoming a Christian from a mega church and just really learning about what this belief system holds to based on what someone on a stage was telling me. 
but no great depth of God's word, Hashem's word, which he has spoken. You know, so often we try and create an opinion about who God is based off what someone tells us. But I wouldn't want anyone to talk about me for them to understand who I am. I would rather them hear it from myself. Who do I say that I am? What do my actions say that I am? And I think it's important for us to understand that God has spoken and God has acted throughout human history to say, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And so as I'm working through my, my Christian journey, I hit a roadblock in 2016. I was working on a very, very popular TV show, which is the originals, you know, millions and millions of people watch it all over the world. And I'd just been uh, in a relationship for three years and I found out my girlfriend at the time had cheated on me, broke my heart. Mm. I was shattered, absolutely shattered to the point where life didn't matter anymore. The, the hurt and the betrayal was so deep that I said, God, I'm done with this world. I'm done. It, I don't think I can overcome this pain. It, it hurts so much when, when someone who claims to love you betrays you in such uh, a brutal, uh, unsuspecting way. And when it's revealed to you, you, you just, you become numb. And I think a lot of people, whether it's a situation with a partner or, or something else in life where they've hit that level of numbness, where they've cried out to God in the quiet of the night saying, I don't want to live anymore. And that's where I was 2016, but I'm not the kind of person who would take my own life uh, just because I hate giving up. I hate giving up. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking, what are some scenarios that I can put myself in that could fast track the end of my life? And so I woke up one morning, I was watching, you know, CNN or Fox and the tragedies of the ISIS movement around Iraq and Syria was just all that we saw. It was mm -hmm. the media exposure. And I was sitting there and I saw this young boy uh, in the back of an ambulance after being hit by some airstrike and he was covered in blood. And I thought, I've got to do something. And I thought, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to go to Iraq. So I started reaching out to nonprofits on social media. One eventually responded. I said, I would like to come out. I'd like to volunteer my time. I'd like to volunteer my voice mm -hmm. against this wicked ideology that is trying to stamp out uh, people's lives and their right just to live. And so one organization invited me out and I volunteered for a few weeks and I got in a lot of trouble. Warner Brothers, I was not happy with me disappearing. <laughs> sure. I flew from Atlanta to Turkey and then Turkey on a, a two-person flight. There was only two other people on the flight to Iraq. And I landed and I just thought, okay, well, this is what I'm doing. And when the organization picked me up, they said, uh, we're in the safe zone right now. We're safe here and we can stay here. We're just so grateful that you've come to support us. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm here to do everything. Let's, I don't care where we go. I'm open to it. And you know, they didn't realize, but I was just like, no, if I die, if I step on an IED, if I get shot, if I get kidnapped and whatever, whatever happens, I don't really care. Like, I don't really care. Just because you were so low and down. I was point, just numb. Right? I was numb. I was, I was, I, life didn't matter to me anymore, you know? Um, and so I start meeting all these young kids in refugee camps and hearing heartbreaking stories of what ISIS has done to this nation and to these people, you know, they saw their mothers being kidnapped, you know, their sisters being raped and murdered. One young boy who's now a refugee in Australia who I've built a very, very close relationship with, um, he was captured by ISIS. They they lit him on fire, you know, from his waist down. He was, he was you know, third degree burns. He, he had a, a limp because his skin, the way it burnt, stopped his ankle from moving correctly. And so you hear these stories every day and you're weeping. You're weeping at humanity. You're weeping at the tragedy of what this world has become, which is void of anything that God had intended or commanded when he first created us. And so you struggle to think like, what's the point of it all, God? And so I was on a dusty field in Iraq one afternoon and I said, God, I'm done. This didn't make it better. My heart is broken. I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to witness what I've seen unfold and I don't want to hear another story of the tragedies that people have to experience because of radi radical ideologies. And God spoke quietly to my heart. And all I remember hearing is if you're that willing to give it up, give it up to me. What's the difference? And it just hit me like a checkmate moment in chess where I had no more moves on the board. And God was right. What's the difference if I don't care? If I don't care if I ever fall in love again, if I don't care if I ever work in Hollywood again, if I don't care if people love me or hate me, if I care about nothing, if I no longer care about the result, what's the difference? Give it all to God. Everything. You have everything now, God. It's all yours. Do what you want with my life, God. I don't want it anymore. I've made that quite clear. It's yours. 
And in that moment, I felt a peace that I'd never felt before. And I came back from Iraq. I was back on the show. I was working and I said, I need to know who you are. So I read the entire Bible cover to cover, Torah, Tanakh, New Testament, 28 days straight through. I was reading, you know, four hours, five hours a day, just, just consumed in the story. Wow. That's, an, that's, you must be a fast reader too. No, no. It, I mean, I just, I was just all day. Wow. I just would not leave the text. And, um, at the end of reading that one word stood out over and over and over again. And it was Israel. And I remember thinking, I don't know anything about Israel. I don't know this people, this nation that you have bound yourself to. And that you said that if the, the you know, the, the ordinances of the sky changes, if, if the, the motion of, of earth ceases to exist, then I'll break my covenant with these people. But until that day, my covenant with them is there and it's confirmed and it's my promise and my word that I will be faithful to them. The word in Hebrew, chesed, the faithfulness of God is put on display and I need, I need to know these people. I need to know his land. So a few weeks later, after I had this experience in Iraq, I started booking flights to Israel and I started making a plan. I need to go there. I need to see it. I need to experience it. If I follow this figure whose name was Yeshua, which means salvation in Hebrew, I need to know who he was speaking to. I need to understand who, who he believed he was called to redeem and restore. So I went to Israel and I was blown away by what I saw, the people, the place, you know, the, the love that the Jewish people have, not only for this land, but for also others and welcoming you in. I wanted to be a part of every Shabbat dinner. I wanted to be a part of every feast, Sukkot, you know, Passover, everything that the Jewish people were doing, I wanted to be a part of so I could watch, listen and learn. And so that's kind of really what started this understanding of the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. first of all. Now, I grew up in a very, very Islamic um, community uh, where I come from in Australia. And so I was only ever exposed to uh, Islam, the Arab world, their customs, their cultures. But what also comes with that is their view of Jewish people in Israel. And so when I got to Israel, I had a dilemma in my mind because I mean, I've been taught by all my friends who are Lebanese, who are, you know, Palestinian, who, you know, come from Iraq or Syria. And they're telling me about what Israel has done and, and what the Jewish people are like, but it didn't match. It didn't match up. And I would go to the West Bank. I would go to Ramallah. I went to Janine. I went to Nablus. I went to Bethlehem. I, I, I was fortunate at that point in my life mm -hmm. that as an Australian, I could go wherever I want. Right. I, I drove past the red signs, you know, when Israelis see that red sign as they're driving through from, you know, zone eight and, and zone B and zone C, which is, you know, another conversation that's a little bit more complicated for people to understand, but different zones where Israelis are allowed either free movement or they're absolutely restricted because of the violence that would happen to them if they entered into a zone that was under Palestinian authority. I went straight through with an Israeli uh, car that I'd got from the airport, Israeli number plate. So I'm driving through Nablus, you know, and I'm like, why is everybody looking at my car so funny? Why is everyone look at me like I'm, you know, some sort of enemy? And why are people coming up to my car asking me what I'm doing here? You know, and praise God, I had sovereignty and protection as I traveled through on an Israeli number plate through areas where, you know, any Jewish or Israeli presence was... It was you putting yourself at risk. Yeah, nothing happened to you, though. No, no. I mean, look, would I do it again? <laughs> Probably not. Right, right. I don't know how long it lasts now, but but the reality was, I was able to see it and, and build relationships with people and 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 have conversations and and learn, you know. And and for me, you know, going into the West Bank it feels so much of what my upbringing was like. You know, I I, I know I don't look like someone who may understand. Arab and Islamic culture and customs, but that was my childhood. Ramadan, I would be jumping the fence and spending time with my neighbors. And, you know, uh, Aid, I would see everyone come around and they'd give gifts and presents. And, you know, we, people would be having conversations about the Quran and, you know, what they believe about Muhammad. And so I, I learned this and I was around this my, my, my entire childhood, my, you know, my, my teenage days. Um, and so it's given me a really, really good understanding of how to make sense of two very, very different cultures um, struggling to find any level of coexistence in 2023. You know, you've got an Arab culture and you've got an Israeli Jewish culture and they're radically different.
Um, and so that's kind of like the background of yeah. how all this came together. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people say that we're very similar in a lot of ways. I'd like to know why you think we're, what's, what's the difference because just, you were, I would say super grew up in it. superficially similar. Sure. I mean, people say that about religion too, though, right? We all believe in the same God. People mm -hmm. say we all, all roads lead to Rome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, sure. Superficially. I mean, uh, as a Christian, I can find similarities with, you know, Islam. I can find similarities with Judaism, Hindu, whatever. You can find similarities in anything. Right. You know, we can find similarities in talking points between liberals and conservatives. <laughs> yeah, that's actually true. Right. But that doesn't mean that fundamentally, right, we're similar. There's anything in common. And it's really what's at the heart of things. What really drives a community that's far more important than the superficial similarities that we might come across. Look, we have to understand Jewish people lived all over the land. They lived in Iraq before they were, you know, exiled. They lived in Yemen. They lived in Morocco. They lived in, you know, Iran. They've, they've lived and they've dwelt amongst other cultures. And that breathes into so much of, you know, their food and maybe even some of their, you know, practices and traditions. But the fundamental difference that I would separate between Judaism mm -hmm. and Islam is we have one religion, which is Judaism. And I would say the key foundational principles that are presented throughout the Torah and the Tanakh is about compassion and mercy. You know, if you go back to ancient texts, you will not find anything older that presents this idea of grace, unconditional forgiveness, despite the wickedness of others. Where do we find this? In the Torah with Joseph and his brothers. His brothers wanted him dead. His brothers threw him into a pit. They basically gave him up for slavery. They rejected him and they lied to their father. And yet we have this moment where Joseph has now been elevated to the second in charge of all of Egypt. And he shows compassion and mercy. And he makes an incredible statement that will change Judaism forever. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. You won't find that in any ancient text. You won't find that idea of, hey, you did wrong, but God's going to do something good with it. Mm -hmm. In ancient texts, this is what you find. You do something wrong, we'll kill you. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, you kill me, I kill you. Right. You take my eye, I take your eye. That's the human way, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's the, the baseline of Judaism. Well, look what's happening. Like people are not even recognizing that right now, you know, Hamas comes into Israel. Right. They slaughter, burn, behead. Yes. 1,400 more, 1,500 now, yep. 1,600 people. Yep. And yet when we go in to retaliate, we warn them. Yes. Because we don't want to, because well, that's, look, our, look, that's our way. Hamas's goal was civilian casualties. Israel's goal is how do we minimize, prevent, stop civilian casualties? Now, let me go back to this idea. If Judaism is all about mercy, mercy and compassion, yep. well, what is Islam? Now, the truth is that this culture in the Arab world and in the Islamic world, it's an honor and shame culture, honor and shame. And I, I would believe that Muslims will accept this. This is an honor and shame culture. We see this in the practices. Yep. It's an honor and shame culture. And so what is the issue that exists is that if you're sitting in the position of shame because you've lost every single war you've started, the only way to regain your honor is to win. And so that's what the world doesn't understand. Let's go back to 1948 on the 14th of May. The very next day, the 15th of May, the Arab League, the Arab nations that surrounded Israel declared war. It's a really important concept for people to understand when they're struggling to work out the nuances of, you know, this battle that's unfolding that has been going on for the last 75 years. There was not a single day where the Arab nation said, let's try and coexist. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality we need to accept. And the Muslim and Arabic world needs to accept that. We never pursued peace, to be fair, because they declared independence from the British mandate in 1948. Right. And the very next day, war was declared. There was no day in between the 14th and the 15th where they said, is there another way we can go? Now, they lost that war. 1967, the yep. Six-Day War, they lost that war. The Yom Kippur War, 1973, yep. they lost that war. They kept losing wars. But remember, on a shame culture, well, we've got to win. And we're going to sacrifice the future of our children. We're going to sacrifice our sons and our daughters to martyrdom because we need to fill the position of honor. 
But what I'm confused about, right, is that a couple things, right? We hear the same words, colonization, yes. oppression, yes. genocide, apartheid. I feel like there, there, there's a certain rhetoric that you're it's, constantly it's, listening yeah. to. Again, it's brilliant. It's, it's, this is what I, I find frustrating because they inject language into the conversation that immediately puts the Jewish people in a position of the problem. In the language. Exactly. And so what media allows to happen and unfold is they allow them to use this language. Well, occupier, colonizer, you know, oppressor. Now, here's the problem. If I went back to Australia, my homeland, and I went up to an Aboriginal person who is considered the ancestral people of their homeland, mm -hmm. and I said, hey, you, colonizer, hey, you, occupier, what would people say about me? They're the ancestral people of this land. It's the equivalent of, uh, imagine if the native... American Indians mm -hmm. reclaimed the United States. Let's just say uh, unbelievable odds, you know, that they were able to reclaim sovereignty and independence of land. No one could say, hey, you're a, you're a colonizer. You're a Native American, you're a colonizer. No one could say that, but the, that's because we all agree and accept that they're the ancestral people of the land. You know, there's a big movement in Australia right now to acknowledge and identify who was here first, right? Mm -hmm. It's a massive movement. And they're, and they're trying to get this point across that it's the Aboriginal people who had this land. We're not going to give it back. Right. But it's the Aboriginal people who had this land. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But here's the problem. The ancestral people of the land of Israel, without a question of a doubt, is the Jewish people. And so when I get into conversations and debates with people who want to deny that reality, I'll play along with them. Okay, sure. The Jewish people don't belong in Israel. They don't. Where do we send them? Tell me their homeland. Where do they come from? Tell me. If we're going to move them out and we're going to give the land back to the people who you believe are the owners of this land, where do we send them? Mm -hmm. Where do they come from? Let me ask you another question. Jew. Why do we call them Jews? Where does it come from? And I say, you know, they're called Jews because they're Judean. I want you to go into Google. And I want you to type in Judea. And I want you to tell me where you land on the map. Because we'll send them back there. You know what's going to come up? Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem. The heart of the Jewish people is that land. You know, the, the Alaska Mosque, the, the, the Dome of the Rock, mm -hmm. it's built on top of the Temple Mount. On top. I know. So how do we work out the history? How do we do our math? Now, here's the other thing I need people to understand. And it's really, really important. And it's something that just gets forgotten in the conversation. Name a single day, a single year, that the pro-Palestinian identity that exists today had complete sovereignty and control over the land that is known as Israel. Give me one day, one year, where they had a government, a currency, where they were the clear owners of the land. Do you know what the reality is? Not a single day. Not a single moment. So where is this coming from? Because, you know, what this, okay, so this is what I don't understand. Because yeah. when I, I post things and then yeah. I, I get Palestinian people yes, of course. who are, they go, they go crazy up. You're not educated. You don't know what you're yes. talking about. You yeah. don't do, do yeah. Is there, is how much of there is a distinction between Hamas and Palestinian people? Well, no, look, that's, because this is, this is the problem now. Traditionally. Israel's approach to, you know, this political party, right? That started off as a political party. Yeah. Um, they wanted to try and give the Palestinian people an opportunity to separate themselves from Hamas. Hey, we see you. We don't want to consider you just a terrorist because we know that this organization has a genocidal goal. So we want to say we see you. We, we, don't, we don't want to put you in the box of Hamas. We want to say you're a Palestinian and that's Hamas. And, 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 and I appreciate Israel's attempt at trying to separate the two because one is radical in nature yeah. and we don't want to paint everyone with the same brush because that would be wrong and we wouldn't want to be painted with the same brush. But here's the problem that we've faced in the last 12 days. The Palestinian people see themselves as Hamas. We can't take the identity that they're claiming to have now from them. I can't tell a Palestinian person who supports Hamas, hey, you're not Hamas. You, you, we don't, I don't see you as Hamas. I am Hamas, Nathaniel. 
I support Hamas. I'm going to take to the streets and celebrate what Hamas has done because that's my, my version of resistance. And you believe even if they don't say it in war, if they don't say it out loud, that's what they, they do now. But yeah. trust me, I, we're going to get into yeah. that. Believe me, they do. Yeah. But the ones who are not. Yeah. And because we Look, talk, if, do you think they really feel if, they, they embody yeah. that? I, I had a I had a conversation with a brilliant, brilliant uh, Israeli who was the last Israeli governor of Gaza before they handed the, mm -hmm. the city over. His name's Grisha. Incredibly bright. Um, knows the nuances better than anyone and really likes to not give anyone what he thinks but puts out the information for yeah. you to make up your own mind. I appreciate him so much. He's amazing. You should follow him on social media. Uh, he's incredible. What's his name? Uh, Grisha. Grisha. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Grisha, uh, in a conversation we had just a few days ago, said if a vote was to take place throughout the West Bank, not Gaza, the West Bank, okay. um, to elect a new leader, over the Palestinian people, right? We have the PLO, which mm -hmm. is run by Mahmoud Abbas, and then you've got Fatah, which has traditionally been enemies of Hamas, and they fight amongst each other, and then you've got Hamas. He said Hamas would win. They would win. They have the attention of people. You know, Janine is a hotbed for terrorism. You know, you've got Lion's Den, you've got Islamic Jihad, you've got these violent groups who are all in support and celebrating what Hamas has done. You know, you go to any place in Nablus after this attack and they're handing out sweets and candy, celebrating. Why is that, though? Because, because they support this cause because they see this as the only way they can win. Mahmoud Abbas has done nothing for them in their eyes. You know, he's one of the only Palestinian leaders who tried to reduce violence and say it hasn't worked for us. He says it hasn't worked for us. Why? Because they've been doing it for so long. You know, the security fences, the, the, the measures that Israel has had to take to protect its citizens has always been in response to the violent acts of Palestinian groups who want to cause mass casualties, who wants to create fear with terrorism, to plead their case that this belongs to them. But see, we always go back to that same reality. Mm -hmm. It's the one simple lie that spurs and creates all this problem. You know, you, you can look at articles that were written, newspaper, you know, headlines that are documenting the events of 1948 and the wars that, you know, have been started by the Arab nations. And it says, Arabs invade Palestine. Arabs invade Palestine. Make that make sense. Right. If they were in the land and this was theirs, why is, you know, these articles and why are these you know headlines in historical papers saying that the arabs are invading palestine and when you look at the history it's just not there it's not there you know ask a palestinian person well who's your most famous you know palestinian and they'll say oh yasser arafat i go okay well let's not use him he's egyptian who have you got yeah yeah, yeah it's true actually you know who have you got if you have this rich history it's got to be shown because I can go anywhere in Israel, throw a stone, start digging and find ancient Jewish archaeology, ancient Jewish history that says, hey, they were in the land. The archaeology all points to one reality, Jewish presence, Jewish presence. We can't find anything that's Palestinian. And so where does this come from? The human rights movement in America paved the way for, for the Palestinian narrative to create an identity. It was essential that an identity was created. And this doesn't really happen until the 1967 war. But wait, I've got, before we even get there, yeah, what I find so, in, like, I'm, what I find very confusing are people who, we, we are, we're separating this, we're saying not everyone is Hamas, yes. there's Palestinians, yeah. but yet the Palest, most, Pal like, whenever I'm speaking to a Palestinian Majority. or the people, yes, they're, they're in a way, defending what happened they say to me it's sh this is what I've, someone said to me yes it's shitty that uh the israelis were murdered and raped but but there's always a but. there's always a but well, at the end and that's it's it's a justification of violence it's and so that that reveals the heart right it says i'm okay with violent means to achieve an ultimate goal right that's well, what they're saying well they're, they're, and so who who pushes that hamas and so now the Palestinian movement that is circulating not only online, but also globally in major cities, they're proclaiming it and celebrating it. There's enough evidence now to say, hey, we can no longer separate the Palestinian identity with Hamas because that's what they're telling us they want. 
And that's the hard reality for all of us to understand because I think as humans, we're like, man, how can you get behind something that has done wicked atrocities, not only I know. to Israelis, but to their own people. But they don't see it that way. Well, that's because this is the war, right? So this is the thing. Is it now, has it now become fashionable just to be pro-Palestine? Well, he, he, this is the perfect storm, right? COVID, COVID hits us and, you know, the, the world gets divided and locked in its doors. And, and what we saw, I think, throughout the world is a social justice movement where we celebrate yep. the reality that now we can be the hero in some oppressed person's story, right? It's the social justice warrior who gets online and says, I'm the hero and I'm going to stand with the oppressed, not because I care, but because I look good when I do it. Right. Exactly. It's it's a it's the woke, it's the, it's woke the virtue signaling mentality of I don't need to know the facts. I just need to pick the right side and then support the right side on social media. So all my friends see that I'm with this movement and I'm with this cause and I want to liberate these people. And here's all the hashtags you need to know. And here's a here's my Palestinian friend who I really care about and just met. But I'm going to photo it and I'm going to document it. I'm going to share the world with I'm with you and I'm for you without any education without any understanding the the tragedy of all this is the real victim of this conflict has and always will be the Jewish people. Yeah. That's the reality. Now, how did we get here? How did we, how did we stop being people who have critical thought? And it's the way we consume social media. Mm -hmm. we, we live in echo chambers and we consume content constantly without context. And this is one of the most important things that I need to articulate, you know, in this current climate is that content without context is very, very dangerous. And a lot of people are speaking who know nothing. And a lot of people are coming to me saying, you have no right to speak. You don't even understand this conflict. I'm sorry. I've been to Israel 25 plus times. I grew up in an Islamic community. I spend more time than most people with Jewish believers. I understand Torah. I understand Tanakh. I understand the Quran. Why am I disqualified from this conversation when you don't even know or could name a single war that unfolded between these two nations? You have not been to the West Bank. You haven't got friends in Bethlehem. You haven't been to Ramallah. You haven't had conversations with the heads of families in Hebron who are overseeing 40,000 people. You have no place to stand in this conversation and you hate what I say because what I say goes against your very false narrative that provides content without context. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's a hundred percent what's happening, and it's not getting any better. It's becoming a. It's becoming much more rampant. So, this is a reality that people won't like. But any group like Hamas, who is willing to commit atrocities, twelve days ago, which involves the rape of women, the kidnapping of children, the, you know, the, the desecration of dead bodies in celebration of what they've done, do you really think these people have a moral compass that says we better not lie? It's unbelievable. Of we better not. tell the truth, yeah. right? Like we've just killed all these people, but hey guys, no lies on social media, okay? Like, you know, the, the, we have to wake up and go, you know, and one of the things that I've been fighting most is the pro- Palestinian narrative has no issue lying. In fact, it's its calling card. I was at a dinner in 2017 in Paris and I had just come back from Israel and I'd seen it with my own eyes and I was sitting at this dinner with a bunch of influential people and actors and, you know, one girl who was uh, had a Moroccan background, Muslim, um, and she was talking to the group on the other side of the table and she I just overheard her say, you know, the IDF kills 100 is uh, 100 Palestinian children every single day. I was like, what? So I, I listened to her and she was trying to explain to this other group of, and they're all going, wow, that's horrible. I can't believe they do that. And I said, excuse me, I just heard you say that, you know, the IDF kills 100 Palestinian children every single day. Did you say that? She goes, yeah. I go, show me the 100 today. Where's the newspaper article? Where's the media report? Oh, well, you know, no, 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 you said 100 today. Show me the 100 yesterday. Show me the 100 on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. And I said, and we got into this huge debate, me and her. And I said, I've been there. I've seen it. I don't, I don't think you're telling the truth. And, and we ultimately got to the place where I said, admit to everybody what you said was a lie. Admit it. But you have no fact of what you said. You've just used manipulative, emotional language to convince these people of your cause. 
And she admitted it. She said, okay, yeah, right. I did. I don't, I don't have the facts. And I said, that's the problem. The conversations that have been unfolding around the nation of Israel have had people like that sharing with the world for decades about these atrocities that haven't been committed. You know, we, we have to understand in conflict, people do die. When there's one nation that wants to destroy another nation and another nation's defending its right, right to exist, there is casualties on both sides. You know? Especially when un like unprovoked yeah. this happens. Yes. And what I feel has happened, why yeah. I became, I feel like it, it awoke like a sleeping giant inside of me, right? Because mm. what I noticed, forget about Jewish, not Jewish, right? It's just sheer evil yeah. doing this. Well, well, again, you know, I've heard many times that, and even today, you know, pro-Palestinian groups will say things like, well, you know, they, they, they rape our women and they kill our children and they, you know, they do all this stuff. Everything that they lied about the nation of Israel was doing, they did on Saturday. They did, they exactly. Did but they did it and they celebrated it. That's, th 100%. this is the most alarming reality. They, it was celebrated. And, and that is one of the most chilling thoughts that I think all of us have somehow easily kind of just sort of let slide, you know. Uh, when and when they're not, fo they're not even focusing on it. Like, no. it's it only happened like 13, 12 days ago, let's say, and now people forgot about it, and yeah. now they're all preoccupied of what's happening yeah. in Gaza. Well, yeah, and, and that's that's the... People need to understand that... Sorry. I mean, we often look at, the, you know, Hamas, or we think of, like, terrorist organizations like ISIS and... We just think they're barbaric. Mm -hmm. and Taliban. We think, yeah, we think they're just, they, they, we think that they're just like, they wake up and they're like, let's kill. And we have to remove that identity that we're placing on them as if they're just barbarians who just have one simple goal, which is bloodshed. That is their goal, but they're actually very, very intelligent and cunning and well planned out. Everything that unfolded on Saturday wasn't to do anything else, but to cause mass casualties and get a huge reaction and response from Israel. And when it happened, they were ready and waiting for casualties. I'm telling you, if Israel didn't hit terrorist, or, uh, terrorist you know, infrastructure in Gaza and not a single you know, Palestinian in Gaza died, they would have killed them themselves or they would have lied about it because they needed it. They needed this narrative. Right. And so we need to start being really, really smart about what are they doing and how are they doing it and why. And so that's the next sort of stage of what we're seeing unfold in the last 12 days. This is going perfectly to plan for Hamas. They break through. They enter through, you know, the Gaza border. They cause mass casualties. They take hostages. They get back. And now they bunker down in their tunnels that they've been building and stealing from, you know, all the humanitarian aid that's been going into Israel. We think that their tunnels are like two men digging this little tiny little hole underneath a fence. It is not that. It is sophisticated tunnels where two soldiers fully armed can walk. A bus can drive through these tunnels. The way they're getting their weapons and rockets in from the Egyptian border, these are, these are well-built highly sophisticated tunnels. We treat them like they're savages and they're cunning and they're smart and what they're doing is running exactly how they planned. They're, they're, the more martyrs of Palestinian people in Gaza, the better it is for Hamas because what they're trying to do right now is they're trying to, one, unite the Arab Islamic world. That's their, that's their number one goal. So they need content. They need to show the horrific atrocities that the, you know, Israeli army is willing to do so that they can present that to the Islamic Arab world to unite a people. And they want to convince the liberal, woke, social justice warrior to also support that movement. And so all they really need is supporters and bystanders. And they're doing it. They're creating it. We've seen this week that they have been so successful. There's a reason why they have professional photographers and journalists capturing every single dead child or injured person that is being rushed into a hospital where a crowd of photographers and journalists and people all make this whole scene. So we see that. But, you know, I would ask this to a, you know, a journalist in Gaza. There's one that I've been watching closely and I can see how he's creating his content. I look past what he's doing because I understand the creation content mm -hmm. process. You know, I would never pick up a dead child 
And the first thing I would think is I've got to pull out my iPhone and I've got to shoot three different angles to make this look tragic and heartbreaking. I just couldn't do that. But they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me question the motive. It makes me see past what we're seeing and seeing what they're doing. And so I would ask this specific photojournalist who's capturing these horrific photos. And trust me, they break my heart. Seeing dead children doesn't make me happy. No, it's terrible but on I both would, sides. Yeah, but I would ask him, why don't you go and take some photos of the 200 plus Israeli hostages who are being tortured by Hamas? You're such a great photographer. I would love for you to capture the tears of young Israeli women who are potentially being raped by animals. How about you show us that? How about you show us some of the hostages and their current state under a torturous, violent group of men who do not care about your life or anyone else's life. They just care about the victory. And so we don't see that. Of course not. What I want to know is why are people, by the way, they don't like any of us. They don't like Americans. No. They don't like uh, LBG, uh, any any type yeah. of uh, gay, uh, LGBTQ, L whatever. Nobody. Yeah. No. But yet these are the people that are standing behind them. Yeah. If they went to Gaza, they wouldn't last two seconds. No. Well, well, they would, they would, what would happen to them is what would happen to them in many Muslim majority countries, you know, Iran included, is they would be taken to the highest building and they would be pushed off because that's the punishment for living that lifestyle. And so it is, we're living in a bizarre time where people are standing up for an organization that would openly and freely and happily kill them. And they want to wave their flag and support them as if this is the justice that the world deserves. This is, can we just say, how, I, I understand all of it. I understand the why, the woke, the social, the, all the social injustice. But for people that they hate you too. Mm. Like they hate you too. I don't, that's what I don't get. It, they, is there like a disconnect between, they think it's, it's been very widely known now. It's not that they just hate Jewish people. No. They hate all of you. Well, and those are the same people that are the loudest screaming for them. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're going to hate anyone that disrupts or breaks the fantasy that they live in, you know? And look, it really it doesn't make sense to me. This though. is how it makes sense in my mind. The reality is we live in a culture and a time where everybody is trying to push the truth of who God is out of the conversation. We're seeing it in America. People don't want to talk about God. And no, they don't care. They, yeah. don't, they don't care. And so about. the further we move God away, the more foolish we become. And that's a great example. You have people who are supporting another group of people who would freely kill the people that you're supporting. And it's like the only word you can describe that with is foolishness. You're foolish. Let me fly you to Gaza right now. You know, you can wear your hot pants, you can wear your, you know, your crop top, you can wave their banner and flag and I will, I will time how long you last. It'll be like a sprint, you know? And so the reality is, it's like, this is just foolishness. The people who you're supporting would be open to killing you. And so God is saying, I'm going to step back. I'm going to take your invitation to ask me to leave. And I'm going to let you do what you think is righteousness, what you think is good. And for people like you and I, all we see is foolishness and wickedness. So it's, you know, I often think about the history of humanity is a testimony against ourselves, how we can't rule over ourselves and we truly need God. But what happened to, remember, you know, you're what, 40 years old, right? Yes. Do you remember when it was turned and the Jewish people, the Israelis, Israel was the oppressed, quote unquote, people? And the, the support was for us. What changed in history where this, where it became, it wasn't just the COVID time, or maybe it, well, it happened through the COVID time, but what was the trigger that changed everything? I don't think there's a trigger. It's a generation, right? Oh. The generation of the Holocaust is now removed from the conversation. They're old They're people who, who experienced or where the people who heard about the atrocities of the Nazis, are, are they either died or they're in nursing homes with no one listening to them anymore, right? So that's exactly So we true. have a generation of people now who, and it's, this is, this, you know, the Bible makes an accusation against when, when the youth rule over the, um, the wise, this is what happens because the youth think they know what they're talking about, but they haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. They haven't. And so we just got the next generation. This is the new generation. And God says, you know, in the Torah, Moses says, you know, my hand upon the throne of Adonai, Adonai will fight uh, from generation to generation with a Amalek, right? And Amalek is this 
group of people who wanted to wipe out the Israelites as they were coming into the promised land, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And God is making a very clear statement. This battle that I'm going to win against one generation is going to restart with another generation. And so it makes sense. We're 80 years since the Holocaust and this new generation has forgotten and stopped paying attention to history because that's what we do. You know, if, I, I said this on mm -hmm. one of my uh, posts. If, if we've learned anything from history, <laughs> it's this, that we didn't pay attention to history. Yeah, we did pay true. attention. The history's there. We can all go back. Anyone can do what I've done and read the, you know, the 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 facts and the data about the reestablishment of this nation, and the lack of presence and ownership of the land of the Palestinian people. No one wants to do that. We all just want to live in the present, which means we just neglect and forget about the history. And the history tells us this has happened, this has happened before, and this will happen again with the same ideology. Now, where did it come from? Lies are like seeds. You plant them in the ground and they look like nothing until they start to grow. But by the time you get a tree, it's a lot more difficult for it to be destroyed and cut down. So the seed, which is the lie against this hatred of the Jewish people, was put in the ground through the educational systems in America, yeah. through the acceptance of language like occupier and colonizer and oppressor, through the neglect of understanding the history of this people and their ancestral homeland. And now that seed has turned into a tree and the fruit is rotten. It's a rotten fruit and people are freely eating from it. Mm -hmm. That's a great analogy. I mean, the, 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 the universities, the colleges here, I am... I'm just speechless because these are all Ivy League schools yeah. that are are supposed to have very intelligent, educated, thoughtful people. Yes, and yet the rallies that are happening, the professors that are that are spewing hate towards Jewish people. By the way, a lot of Jewish people go to all of those schools. Yeah, yeah, they don't matter. They just, but, but well, there's again these all that the, there's so many disconnects for me. Well, so, so yeah. So here's the other. And reality. the funding is a lot of it's coming from, from Jewish, Jewish people. people. Why? Which is, is which is incredible. It's like you want to you want to hate a people that have funded your educational system. You want to hate a people who pour out probably more money and more aid. And it's like I'm I'm amazed that Israel will be the first nation in the Middle East that will go to an earthquake zone. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, some sort of natural disaster happens. In the, we saw it in Morocco. We saw it in Turkey. We see it in Syria. Israel is the first one to go in. They're, they are a beautiful, generous, compassionate people that are willing to pour out what they have to help others. And yet the world constantly wants to try and believe this lie that they're the enemy, they're the problem, they're the issue. And it's, you know, here's the reality, right? We can talk on this physical level of what is seen but we have to get to a point where the spiritual unseen is really what's starting to be elevated the world hates god okay that's a fact the world hates god and they hate a god who has spoken and defined himself they like the god where they can define god I, I well this is what i think my god is and my god kind of has his own rules and i have my own personal relationship with god a lot of people say you know but they hate a God who has spoken. You know, it's for me as a Christian, a lot of people will go to church during Christmas and they love the, the, the story of baby Jesus, but they hate the stories of adult Jesus. Why? Because now Jesus is speaking. Baby Jesus says nothing. Oh, that's, a, that's actually a good, that's a good point. But when he speaks, people don't like it. And if Jesus says, I haven't come to bring peace to the world, but a sword, I'm going to be divisive. You're either going to love me or hate me. You're going to either love me and believe me or you're going to turn against me and hate me. No in between. There's no middle seat that you can sit. Right, right, right. He understood. He understood this. But he, what he was getting at is the world ultimately hates God because they love darkness. And so when we remove God, we remove back. We can live in our darkness and we can be happy in our darkness. And so, again, the educational system, it just reveals that they would prefer to choose darkness than God because you have to submit to God. But wouldn't you think the professors who are spewing out this hate towards their Jewish students in the rallies, like they would be at least have the wherewithal to think, hmm, I'm on a platform. I'm like, I'm teaching at this school. Maybe it wouldn't be such a great idea. But see, that's where it's spiritual. That's where it's unexplainable. It doesn't make sense because in the spiritual world it's a battle of good versus evil as soon as god said these are my people i'm picking one group of people these are my people 
that was the moment. That was the moment where the world said, now we know who to kill. Now we know who to fight. the chosen people, well, yeah. think of it like this. I can't kill God. I can't destroy God, but I can do the next best thing. I can remove his people. If he loves them and I hate him, well, I'll hate his people. This is in Torah, right? The very first murder that is presented in the entire Torah is Cain and his brother Abel. Abel, yeah. And it happens quick, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them bring an offering to God, but God accepts Abel's offering. He doesn't reject Cain. He just accepts Abel's offering. And what God is doing is saying, I'm, I have a unique relationship with Abel. And Cain's jealousy drove him to kill his own brother because of a unique relationship. And so I look at that and I see God saying, this is the blueprint. You understand the pattern, you'll see exactly what's happening. The second I have a unique relationship with the people, the brothers, humanity will want to kill them. Not because they're any different, but because I chose them. And they hate me because I chose them. For me as a Christian, I celebrate the Jewish people. I don't want to be in your position. I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I don't want to just have the title, well, I'm God's chosen person. I'm happy to celebrate that God chooses people and he loves people and he's faithful to people. I can enjoy that. And I can celebrate that. And I want to get behind God's story and his kingdom said, God, I love you. And I know that the nation of Israel is the apple of your eye. And so if I love you, then I have to love them. I have to. And I'm going to love them just like you love them. And even if, the, like I, I said this in interviews, you know, because it's not the first time I've supported this nation. And I said in an interview on an Israeli TV show, I said, even if this entire nation turned their back on me and said, we hate Nathaniel, we don't want his voice, he's a Christian, we don't want him, we don't need you, I would still support them. I would still stand with them because I'm not doing it for anyone's validation. I'm doing it for the glory of the God that they follow, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the man, the men that believed the promises of God and they had relationship with, I believe in that God, the, the living God. Nathan, my God, um, you're remarkable. What has this done to your acting career? Your, has it, has it, has it um, affected it in any way? Yeah, look, it's, I mean, the reality is that, you know. Like before this war happened. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. First and foremost, you know, I, I celebrate the, the salvation that Jesus has brought to my life, the transformation that he brought about my life. And that's not popular in Hollywood. You know, Christian Judeo values are not what is desired in Hollywood. So, of course, I've been put at the bottom of the food chain, hated. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's people on my show that I worked on who will not even be in the same room as me because of my stance. You know, there's one particular actor who I won't name, but he is very, very much, you know, supporting the pro-Palestinian movement because, you know, his grandfather was a, a Lebanese politician and very vocal against his hatred towards Israel. And he just follows in his father's or grandfather's footsteps, of course. And, you know, I'm not allowed to be in the same room as him. Per the conversation that his management team had with the organizers, you're not allowed to be here. You're not allowed to be in this room. I don't care. I have no problem with him. Live your life. Support who you want. But this is the mentality of these people. When they can't handle to stand in front of someone who has an education and understanding, they'll remove you. And I'm sure I've been removed from Hollywood. I've lost jobs in Hollywood because they're going to go on my Instagram and they're going to look at this kid who, in their eyes, just looks like a kooky Christian who just loves <laughs> God, you know? So, yeah, I've, I've, I've lost and I will probably continue. Like people probably think I'm some rich Hollywood actor because I worked on a TV show. I come from poverty. My mum was a refugee to Australia. She was born in Egypt. You know, my mum was a refugee. We grew up poor. I, I you know, I, I didn't make a lot of money from the TV show because when I became a Christian, they refused to let me become a series regular. They don't want to elevate my voice. For what reason? Because they don't like my message. So, yeah, I've lost. But like I said, in Iraq, I said to God, I don't care. If I never work again in Hollywood, I love acting. It's my passion. I love it. I never work again. Don't care because my, my purpose is so far beyond my passion. You know, and, and my purpose is to glorify God with whatever I do. So do you, how do you make your living now? Don't <laughs> you don't. Like I was leading tours through Israel, teaching the Bible. Um, you know, I still am fortunate enough that the show is popular. I've been able to do fan conventions. But, you know, besides that, I just, you know, I figure out ways to, you know, I have a clothing label. I sell Christian clothing when I can, when I have time and, 
you know, I just try and do whatever I can to get ahead. It's, you know, the problem with what I'm doing is it consumes so much of my time because I can't just have an opinion that isn't grounded in truth and facts. So the requirement, just like when I read the Bible, is I'm going to have to give up something. I'm going to have to sacrifice something. I'm going to have to, you know, I could, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a smart guy. I, I could go off and, you know, do anything I want. I could start my own business and I could, you know, do a media thing or I could do, you know, I could, I could consult on companies and give them, a, you know, I could do whatever I want. But my time is spent in breaking down what's happening in this world and trying to encourage and inspire other people not to be deceived by their lives. You know, the entertainment industry, let's talk about it, because yeah. there's a lot of Jewish people, obviously. Yeah. And there's a whole thing like Jews run Hollywood, yeah. all this nonsense. Yeah. Yet, well, you know... I think it, the other thing we need to we need to elaborate on with this statement yeah. is that just because you're Jewish, born Jewish, mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have an understanding of what's happening. That's, what, that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Yeah. Or care. Care, yeah, because there's a lot of Jewish... People in Hollywood potentially, but they maybe never been to Israel. Right, they're, they're Jewish by just by uh, well, birth. By birth, yeah. yeah. It's it's, a, it's you know you're, you're you're Jewish by birth, and you can be Jewish by belief, but there's a big difference between those two realities. And so it's always interesting when you know very very liberal Jewish people will take to social media and say, "I'm Jewish." And I do not stand with Israel, and I do not stand with the atrocities of what this nation is doing. And you're like. Just because you're Jewish doesn't mean your opinion has. It'd be like, okay, so you're Jewish and you stand against Israel. So you're telling me I only have to find one Muslim who stands against Hamas and now they're discounted right. in what they're doing? Exactly. It's, it's kind of foolish because it's like just because you, you're born into uh, a culture doesn't mean you have a well-versed understanding. I mean, look, you get me in a room with most Jewish people and – whether they like it or not, I understand their own text more than they do because I read it. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the Torah and the Tanakh back to front. I can sit with rabbis and have very, very deep and meaningful conversations that most Jewish people couldn't. And in fact, everywhere I go and I have conversations with people unrelated to this event, just talking about Judaism or, you know, Hashem, the first question they ask is, so you're Jewish, right? And I go, no, I'm a Christian. And they're shocked. I mean, shocked. last night I was speaking at an event to raise money for, um, you know, the victims of, of these terrorist attacks and raising money for necessary supplies for this nation. And people said, we're so glad that we have other Jewish people like you. And I'm like, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> I am not Jewish. I am, I am a Goyim. <laughs> yeah, according right, to right. your understanding, I am, you know, a Gentile. I am someone who, you know, is, is not part of this covenant but I'm here to support the covenant. Do you feel like, I mean, we have, okay, so we have some out, outspoken Jewish people who are similar to you, right, right. who are Jewish. Right. But do you think because we have a lot of people who are so liberal and, or self-hating, I call them self-hating yeah, Jews, well, look, that's it, yeah. becoming a major problem. Yeah. And they don't have a big enough voice to, to, they, to com combat the problem. They're taking a strategy, I think, that, um, look, you have to understand when you're in a position where the world hates you and you know it, it is scary. It's not yeah. easy to stand up and be proud Jewish and say, you know what, love me or hate me. I'm going to be who my God has called me to be. That's we, I have to remember that's a tough position to stand in. And not everyone has the, the chutzpah. The chutzpah. Right? Yeah, right, 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 right. To right. kind of take that on. So the strategy that they've chosen and elected to take is I'm going to denounce it. So, so the, the people who hate us will actually just leave me alone, maybe, you know? And we even see this when, you know, the Nazi movement was happening in, in Germany. There were Jews that had probably influence and saw what was going on, but they thought, you know what, just let's not say anything. They might just, they're angry, but maybe if we just keep to ourselves, they'll leave us alone. Let's not get involved and let's just say, hey, you know, whatever. Like, and they all died. And they were murdered. And so I think what we really have to understand is if you are a Jewish person who thinks taking the path of like, hey, I'm against what they're doing, even though I don't really understand what they're doing and I have no concept of Hamas or, you know, Islamic Jihad and I've never actually been around any, you know, Arab people who want my life just because of my blood that runs through my veins, maybe it's better that you just say nothing. Let the Jewish people who understand this and let the people who truly understand what's unfolding uh, behind the scenes, because there's a greater story going on here, which I want to tap into. 
this is not just Hamas. This is not just uh, the Palestinian narrative. Uh, this is our land. You stole it. You've oppressed us for 75 years. So this is payback. It's this is. We have to be really clear that that was um, some of the narrative that has unfolded over the last 75 years. But what we're actually experiencing now is much more complex and deeper. And we have to turn our, our eyes to the Islamic Republic uh, of Iran, the Islamic regime, because they're behind all of this. If you want to understand the dragon, well, the head is in Iran and they have an ultimate goal, right? And that starts to open up a whole bunch of more complex things that your audience might not understand. If I said to them, well, there's, there's Shiite Muslims and there's Sunni Muslims. And if we all know what ISIS tried to do, they were Sunni Muslims and they tried to create a caliphate. Right? And our caliphate is this empire of Islam that wants to conquer and get the entire world to submit to Sharia law, to the to the you know the philosophies and principles that Muhammad explained in in the Quran, and they want the world to submit to Islam. And a caliphate is this empire that has absolute power and control to do whatever they want. And so ISIS failed, but they were very, very close in conquering a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. the Middle East. They failed because of resistance. You know, the Kurds stood up against them and thank thankfully a lot of, you know, moderate Muslims said, we can't, this is crazy. We're killing people, beheading people, they're, they're savages. We need to also stand against and obviously the Western world was like, if we don't stop this, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop in the Middle East. Doesn't just, they don't they, they don't want the, you, the the goal of a caliphate with a, a radical ideology isn't just like hey we want the Middle East and leave us alone they're like we want the world but Hamas wants the world exactly but see they're following the orders of the Islamic regime so this is where it gets complicated the Islamic regime is a Shiite Muslim ideology and they they differ in some of their you know their stances on you know the Prophet and and all the things that they want to represent which which is like their idea of true Islam but they see the opportunity now to take the Middle East because it's a disaster it's a mess you know Syria is a mess Lebanon's a mess you know um, Egypt is a mess it, it, it's just instability all over and so Iran sees their one opportunity in human history to be hey we can be the ones who unite the Islamic world. But there's one thing standing in our way, Israel. And if we can defeat Israel and we can present this victory to the Islamic world as none of you could defeat the Jews, but we did it. We can unite the Islamic world and we can bring Islam to, to the nations. But it starts with Israel. That's the victory that they want, right? Wow, yeah. Now, recently, Vladimir Putin came out in support of the Palestinian people. Shocking. Yeah. I thought, Russia, don't you th do you think that he's behind this whole well, thing to get stuff away from this Ukraine? This is what I would present. This is what I would present. Vladimir Putin said that he would conquer Kiev in three weeks. Mm -hmm. We're up to, what is it, uh, 18 months now maybe? We're moving least, into Yeah, at least, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. He failed. He failed. And I he's think, failing. Yeah, well, he's failing. He's still in the fight. And he realizes that his failings up until this point is because of the support of the US. of the US and Europe, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we admit that there's troops on the ground or not, we know all our military equipment is now working in the Ukraine. So Vladimir has a motivation. He wants to win and the US is in the way. And Iran has an enemy, Israel, who's an ally with the US. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, a week, two weeks ago, the Islamic regime went together in parliament and they chanted death to America, death to America, death to America. So now they have a common goal. Vladimir wants Kiev, the Iranians want Israel, and now they can work together. And so what's happening now that no one's talking about is the bombing of key locations in Syria by the Russians, because they control the airspace, and they're hitting places that are against the Assad government because he says, okay, you know what, Iran, I'll do your deal. I'll take care of Syria and I'll take care of all these little issues and I'll help you and I'll support you and I'll get behind the Palestinian people. So America gets dragged into another war. Right. And once they do, and their position is weakened in Ukraine, I get what I want, you get what you want. So now China, same deal. China steps out, says, hey, we're in support of the Palestinian people. Whoa, time out. China, weren't you taking Muslims to concentration camps to kill them, and now you're caring about the Palestinian identity? It seems a little bit hypocritical, but okay. But everyone has a piece on the board that they want. Well, who does China want? 
Taiwan. So everyone's got a piece, Mm -hmm. right? And so what we're seeing is the nations now formulating a plan. Now, why has this happened? Because the the United States of America, the world power, became weak because we started having conversations about gender and gender identity instead of saying this world is wicked and we need to stick to the truth of what this nation was built on, which is one nation under God. And now we've become weak. And now the nations of wickedness are rising up. They're rising up. And they're banding together. They're banding together because now is their opportunity. And so this is the crazy reality that we see ourselves in, you know, on, on, a, on you know, as if we zoom in and we look at what's happening in Israel, we see this between Palestinians and, and Israelis and, you know, people debating over whose who's land and right for freedom is. But if we zoom out... We see this as turning into a world war of wickedness. Exactly. I and agree. that's the scary part. That's for me as a, as, as a believer and someone who reads Torah and Tanakh, I know exactly what the prophets have said about end times. It's not pretty. Really? No. It's ugly. In fact, there's one specific statement in the Tanakh where God says that there's a time coming which is called Jacob's trouble, which is the nation's trouble, you know, the children of Israel. Jacob's trouble, and it's going to be worse than any other point in their history. And I used to read that, and I thought, what could be worse than the Holocaust? Six million Jews gone. What could be worse? Saturday, after seeing what Hamas was capable of doing in 24 to 48 hours, mm-hmm. raping women, you know, ripping out the 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 you know the fetuses of of pregnant women slaying children in their beds while they sleep during Shabbat, killing the innocents, the older, the elderly, all this, you're like, wow, we've seen it. And more than that, it's celebrated. And more than that, it's supported by people who think they're believing in freedom. That's worse. We, 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 we are walking into a very, very scary time in human history. And to be fair, you know, this is what we deserve because we reject God. You know, so again, why is Torah so interesting? God swept the wickedness of the world in the Noah story, which people think is maybe fiction, you know, even though, you know, they can go to the the Grand Canyon and say, well, whatever created the Grand Canyon was a massive body of water that happened like that, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Geologists will make this claim. You mean like a flood? Yeah, like a flood, like a giant worldwide flood? Yeah, like like a giant worldwide flood. You mean like what the Bible says? Oh, well, I won't go that far. But, (laughs) But that's the reality, right? And so God wiped out the wickedness of the land because he says it's just gone so far beyond redeemability Mm -hmm. that I can only pull out Noah and his family. I'm going to give them a means of salvation in an ark, but everything else has to be washed away. And so the word for this wickedness, this word for this violentness, this fanatical, wicked violence in the Torah, you know what the word is? Hmm. Hamas. Really? Yes, that's the word, Hamas. How did God know? And how did we not let this reality that God has been telling us this story? You know, God says in uh, Isaiah 46, 10, he says, I declare the end in the beginning. I'm going to tell you what happens in the beginning. That's how you know I'm going to be God. That's how you know I'm sovereign. That's how you know I'm outside of time. I'm going to tell you everything's going to happen, but you've got to pay attention. And the fact that it says this wickedness is going to be swept away and this word is Hamas and now we've seen the wickedness of Hamas, man, return to God and listen to what he's saying, you know, because our time is running out. And so the real question for us, you know, will I be able to overcome this evil? Probably not. That was my next question. Where, where, how and where and how do we find peace now? Do you think, we, we, by the way, we haven't even touched upon the hostages, right? Like, no. Wh- wh- I mean, do you think so there are a lot? Like, yeah. like um, where are they? Are they, like, do you, like, where, do you think they're, they must be keeping a few alive? I've heard reports of what's happening to them, um, which I'm not um, allowed to say just because of the families um, that are still hoping that loved ones are okay, um, but it's not good what I've heard from very, very uh, verified, uh, you know, credible accounts and resources who are saying what's happening to them is it would make you sick. And I'll, I'll tell you that off camera, but I, I don't think it's right to say it. Um, and being filmed just because of the people who are still holding on to hope that they'll see their loved ones. 
Um, mm. They but, did that one video. I don't. I, I can only imagine, and it makes me sick just to think about it. Yeah, yeah it is. They, it's heartbreaking. That's why I don't sleep. You know, that's why when 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 people tell me to shut up or they try, you know, my account's been taken down four times. I want to talk about that too. Yeah, so four times they've brought it down, and they've got a strategy again. They're they're pretty smart. Um, you know, massive. You know. Um, influences in you know the Arab and Islamic world all come together and they basically say to their millions of followers hey mass report don't go onto his post mass report his account bring him down take him out which is which is a good thing right because whatever I'm saying must be true if they can't fight it with their own words and they have to remove it mm -hmm. so it's a good thing for people to see that they're they're scared of what I'm saying um, because you have an influence because there's someone else, I don't want to give the guy, I'm not even going to mention his name because he's a, such a scumbag. Yeah. I won't yep. even say his name. I know who you're name. talking about. Yep. And you know who he is yeah. and he's despicable. Yeah, well, look, you, look, I would say this about him, you know, and I'm sure people will be able to work out who he is. You know. He'll block you if you say anything bad about him. Really? Or if you, if you go on the account and and say anything that's oh, even I rational. To, I want him to block me. Sean King, yeah. you're the worst human then. He's uh, a scumbag. <laughs> well, this is, this is the thing. Look at his track record. The man loves to support any movement that is driven by hate. Any movement that's driven by hate and has no desire for actual equality or peace, this is the man that they have. He's their poster child. And you can see it. I mean, like, look, yep. I meet people all the time. And um, and even, you know, the person who dislikes me uh, on the show because of his pro-Palestinian stance, people will come up to me and say, look, I've heard both you speak. And... There's something about you, Nate, that brings peace and light, and I see the goodness of your heart. But when these people speak, they're angry. They have no peace. And, and, and they're driven by a darkness in their eyes that almost seems to consume them. And when I look at Sean King and I look at the way he presents things, I don't think he has peace. And I think he is so consumed by whatever he experienced in his own life, which, you know, I hope God restores and redeems. Um, he's an unhappy man and he's, and, and he uses this wickedness and violence that he either has in his heart to fuel his purpose. So he needs to attach himself to movements that are the same in nature. You'll know them by their fruits. You know, I, um, I had this interesting moment with the Jewish, uh, the Jewish world about, three months ago. Um, I love Israel, as you can see. Yeah, really? Right? <laughs> and um, I have a lot of really dear friends in Israel who I consider family. Um, I, I fight for them, you know. And so one of my friends, he runs a boat company in the Galilee and um, he was wearing um, tefillin one morning and, and he said, I want you to do it. I want to put this on you and I want you to pray as we pray because you are like a brother to me and I really appreciate everything you do for my, my people. So I put it on and you know, I prayed the prayers with him and someone took a photo and it was a really special moment for me because I have such a heart for these people and I know what they've experienced and I have such empathy for their struggle, even, you know, in all of this. So I put this post up on my social media and the backlash I received from the Jewish community was was harsh and really yeah you know this is a closed practice how dare you christians come into no. the yeah of course and look to some extent i i get i didn't what really? they're trying to say i get it look i understand because you're you've had so many people who have tried to you know do horrible things to you in history i understand so i you know look i a lot of people were against me you know very you know strong willed Jewish people who want to protect their identity and they know that the world's against them and they really came at me. And I, you know, I am the kind of person who said, look, let me have a conversation with you. And I remember saying to several of them, you will know me by my fruits. Maybe right now you can't see my motivations or why I wanted to put this post up, but you will see it. And the same people that, you know, were upset with me for what I did back then are all friends now. You know, and they're all, you know, obviously now they've had an opportunity to see where my heart is. And so what's the point of it all? You know, we, we, we got to judge someone by the fruits of their life. And it might take some time, you know. Fruit doesn't grow off a tree straight away. So, you know, you look at Sean King, and I'm sure if you dig into his life and you see what he's doing behind the scenes, you'll find some pretty dark things. 
And if you look into my life, you'll see whatever God wants you to see as the reflection of who I am and who I'm trying to glorify. So that's that's how you learn. You got to pay attention to things, you know. Right. You got to pay attention, but a lot of people don't. They have a very short attention span. Yeah. And that's how this is kind of becoming very scary in this world for anti-Semitism yeah. and everything else around. Yes. yes. And uh, I want to get back to the hostages for a second. Yeah. Um, even though we don't want to talk, uh, disclose what you were just saying with regards to what you've heard. Do you have some of the, do you have them back channels that are people that people are reporting to that, you know, some stuff that otherwise, I guess the general public doesn't know because you are so vocal or pe do you have yeah, people boots look, on the ground, so to speak? Uh, yeah. Look, I've, you know, the Jewish community, especially in Israel, is small. You it's know? very small. Um, you know, I, I said this last night at, at the, the fundraiser. This is not the way in which I wanted to be known by a nation. You know, like this right. was not, you know, if, if there was another way that I could have the same sort of uh, impact, impact <laughs> that wasn't this, I would have definitely chosen it, you know. Um, but in saying that, you know, it's a small community and a lot of people are very, very, you know, grateful for what I'm doing. And I've had extremely grateful relationships and contacts with, you know, people in politics and the military and, you know, influencers and you know, everyone, everyone in Israel is hurting. Everyone lost someone. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody lost someone. And there's many people who have loved ones that are still missing. So that's, you know, where I get kind of a lot of my information. Um, and it's hard. You know, it's hard to, I, like, since Saturday, I haven't woken up and, and felt like I can be happy. Mm -hmm. I haven't felt like I can take a break. I haven't felt like I can, um, you know, do something for me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as, while these people are still hostages and while the world still tries to create all these new lies about, uh, Israel and the Jewish people, I, I, I can't stop. My mum keeps telling me, you got to stop. you got to look after yourself. Friends are saying, you got to stop me. You've you know, lost weight, you said, yeah, a lot I of lost weight. lost a lot of weight. How much weight did you lose? I don't know, probably down probably 10 to probably 12 pounds, I reckon, now. You know, I work out a lot. I train a lot, and I love to work out. I haven't done it for 10 days, but I haven't eaten. I just haven't eaten, you know, because it's... You lost your appetite, probably. Yeah, it's hard to eat when and your phone's blowing up and, you know, you're getting... You know, this is like a situation where things change every hour, mm -hmm. you know, like last night with the rocket attack that, yep. that struck the hospital. I mean, we haven't even spoken about that, but like, again, instantly, you know, social media blows up and blames Israel mm -hmm. for their airstrike on a hospital where five to 800 people have been killed. And the fact is it was an Islamic Jihad rocket that misfired or misdirected and hit its own people and again the shocking reality the world was so quick to blame israel and now that the information has come out where it's no it was actually palestinians killing palestinians they're not quick to to condemn or blame or or shift their support of a wicked ideology that celebrates the martyrdom of their own people and like that's the proof right they've killed their own people now everyone's everyone can see the facts we could we've had a you know, intercepted conversation between two Hamas operatives who have discussed like, oh, Whoops, this one's I us. Saw. it's the I, shrapnel. I posted about it. Yeah. And, and yet, people don't care. And yet, again, your, your, your liberal Jewish person who says, I can't support this nation, won't come, come out and make a post going, well, in light of recent events that these people are willing to put their own people in the line of fire, I can't support them. That's wild to me. Why? It's that, this is why you're sitting here. The whole thing is absolutely wild. We constantly have to give, we, when, we, when, we, when you see a, a, an actual picture or hear a voice of someone, who, of, of the people who are doing it, and they're like, well, where's the evidence? Yeah. Where's the evidence? And then when the evidence is proven, they're like, oh, okay, let's well, then move your on. Well, account gets taken down oh. because it's too graphic. Or it's, too, gra or it's yeah. too graphic. But you know what's interesting? It's like... Or they don't care. They move on to another pro reason. Uh, Pro-Palestinian accounts are not getting taken down despite the fact that they're presenting graphic content as Why well. Why is... That was my question to you. Yeah, because... Say that again because I want yeah. people to understand that because that is the truth. Yeah. Who have... They have... They put on... If you check, if you go on the algorithm for, yeah. for, for Palestine, yeah. they have... What, what, post after post and reel after reel yeah, yeah. of the most gruesome things yep. happening. Yep. And 
they are, like you said, they have tons of photographers and people who are right there when right. something is waiting, happening, waiting, 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 yeah. and yet nothing is being t- done to their accounts. No, because well, see, look, th- this is again, it goes back to the the coordination mm-hmm. and the intelligence mm-hmm. of this operation. They've been planning this for two years, two years. So that's two years of aid and money going into the Palestinian people in mm-hmm. Gaza that's been stolen and stripped from them and invested into rockets, military equipment, you know, ammunition, you know, working on intelligence, working on strategies and plans to enter into Israel and and, and do what they did. But more than that, they're not stupid. They know that the battle for public opinion is being fought online. So they create millions of bots through the Islamic regime. How do they even do that? Well, they're, they're in, they've, they've got intelligent people. So why isn't Israel not doing this? They're, not, they're Israel, not doing it. Israel, look, to do, think about the integrity of what they're doing. They're misleading, they're misguiding, and they're manipulating a conversation. Like when you stand on the, on the side of truth, you have to have integrity in what you do. I'm not going to go around report. I'm not going to go to my followers and waste my time saying, Hey everybody, let's, let's mass report Sean King's account to bring him down. I'm not going to do that because I don't believe in removing someone's voice. I can, I can disagree with it. I can, I can radically say this guy is a liar and a cheater and a deceiver, but I'm not going to waste my time and lose my own integrity by saying he should be silenced take his voice down because I think it's better that people see both and say, well, one guy seems very angry and hateful and another guy's just presenting facts with data, with history, with, you know, real evidence. And I'm not seeing the context, the context out of the Palestinian side. So look again, the Islamic regime know what they're doing. They knew this day would come. They knew it would come to social media because this is where the battleground is now. The battleground is to convince the masses. The battleground is to unite the Islamic world. And so they've got everything planned. So people like me stand up and they now I've made a name for myself in this conversation. Well, I'm the target. And so they have all their bots and all their followers just mass report me to remove my voice because they go, this is what we're going to need to do. That There were people sitting, having meetings about moving forward with this plan and the different scenarios that are going to pop up, but probably this is one of them. And we have to accept that. Israel has to get on the front foot. Israel has to stop fighting this battle in a reactive way. We keep reacting to what the uh, Islamic regime and Hamas are doing and then responding. We need to get on the front foot and start predicting their steps, start predicting what's next so we can get to it and share share that to the world so people start going, oh, okay, now I see the play. You know, that's what I'm trying to do on my social media. I'm trying to get people ahead of it, so trying to expose what they're doing so when it comes up again in the next week or two, we go, okay, like uh, once Israel starts the ground offensive in Gaza, that's where the real conversation of public opinion is going to shift. Right now we're seeing the glimpses of that, but I don't think you're ready for the onslaught of anti Israel and anti-Jewish sediment that's going to come when they really have to do what they need to do, which is destroy, you know, the north part of Gaza, because it's all underground. You can't leave it there now. It's all underground. And they're using their own people as so here's human the, shield. I want to give you an example. This is what Grisha explained to me. Talking point. How can Israel cut off the water from Gaza? That's, that's unbelievable that they are creating this humanitarian crisis. So, Grisha... He's the he's the the last governor of Gaza. He knows he he knows he knows people still in Gaza. He's still doing business with people in Gaza because he has a uh, a concrete company. He says, Nathaniel, do you know how much water Israel supplies to Gaza? No, Grisha, ten to fifteen percent. That's it. That's what we cut off. Ten to fifteen percent. Is that our fault? Do you know what happens to the rest of their water supply? Hamas has destroyed it and taken whatever they need for themselves. Who's creating the humanitarian crisis? Is it Israel who says, okay, no, 10% of the water that we've been giving you, we're going we're gonna to stop that? Or is it Hamas who has, you know, 75 to 80% of the water that they've probably also destroyed their natural resources, you know, these, these, these aqueducts that they have that they've destroyed in replace of tunnels and terror? Why is nobody talking about that? Because people don't know. 
and people don't want to sit and listen and have conversation and actually get to the heart of it. That's one example, right? Hamas is a perfect example of an organization that has no overheads besides their military campaign. So Israel destroys like, um, you know, Hamas infrastructure. Let's say that they build it right next to, you know, some sort of, you know, school or, you know, facility that helps Gazans and Israel warns everyone, they get out, they destroy it. Hamas doesn't rebuild it. We rebuild it with our taxpayer dollars. We rebuild it because Hamas says we're not going to pay for it. We know an NGO is going to come in with all their money and they're going to do it. So we'll let them pay for that so we can keep paying for our military weapons. Well, that's the other thing. People keep on saying that, you know, uh, it's they don't have they're, they're living so oppressedly they live like like animals Think about the them. open air yeah. prison meanwhile they okay. were, they have a lot of money yeah. but they took it and yep. bought weapons with the 100%. money but like let's break another one open air prisons yeah 18,000 gazans cross the border every day to work in israel yep explain to me how that's open air prison now you might say well there's you know 2 million people in gaza nathaniel but it's not an open air prison if and and, and the reality is the reason why there's so much security around Gaza is exactly why Saturday hasn't happened earlier. Imagine if there was no security. You know, I, I say to Jewish people, imagine if Israel's response and, uh, you know, ability to prevent them getting further, how far, how many would they have killed? You know, how many more would have died mm -hmm. than 14, 1500? It would have been 20,000. 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. What stops them is the security that Israel has. Well, that's world. the thing. It's, it, they they um, reversed it. The, the wall is to protect Israel. Yeah. And, and it's not, yeah. the, it's not and, for... And so here's the other problem, right? People go, well, that's Hamas. What about the Palestinian people? Well, when the walls were breached, Palestinian people were crossing over into the kibbutzes and they were stealing, they were raping, they were pillaging, and they were doing whatever they wanted. And so it's like, well... Which one is the problem? Like Hamas has got the guns and killing people, but a lot of the Palestinian people in Gaza were crossing over also, young men and raping women and stealing, like taking things from the, the you know, the slain victims of Hamas and going through their houses and taking whatever they wanted, you know? Like it's bizarre to me where people think this is like some sort of humane military operation for liberation when it was all about mass casualty and destruction. Um, so they're just, you know, Gaza shares a border with Egypt and there's two crossings. And, and Egypt says, we don't want to the refugees. <laughs> no one. Uh, nobody. Not no one. one. Yeah. Not and, one, and, and, not and, one and, Arab country. And Egyptians are telling me. And for social media influences, one of the girls who mass reported me was an Egyptian actress. And she's telling me that Israel's inhumane when her own country and nation refuses to accept any people who are fleeing the conflict that Hamas started. The hypocrisy is insane. And to the young Egyptian actress, if you ever see this, thank you for bringing your followers to my account so they can see the truth because you're not going to share it. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I saw that you were taught you, you yeah, posted about that. It's the wild. hypocrisy is just, this is what's, it, it, it yeah. just gets me, it gets my blood boiling. Yeah. And I think, look, Israel hasn't, hasn't done a great job uh, exposing this. They, I think they sat on the side of like, well, we're, we're, we're the good people and we're telling the truth. People will eventually see it. People will see it, and we found out how that how that works for the guy from uh, in the how it worked in the Holocaust. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. They, they, look, it's it's not that time, and you're not dealing with an enemy that has any morals or integrity or righteousness. You you know, it's it's tough. So how do we how do we how do we shift the conversation? How do we find or or shift the conversation to a more balanced place and re like kind of reconfigure what's happening now? with all the pro-Palestinian and that they're the, you know, how they're oppressed and the Jews are the bad people and all this stuff, all the anti-Semitism. How do we, how do we, how do we change all the anti-Semitism? How do we make it a little bit more, or how do we not, how, I should say this, not even how do we change it. How do we keep it from getting growing worse. and yeah. getting worse? How about that? How do we keep it from not becoming even more intense than it is now? Can I be honest with you? Yeah, of course. I don't think we can. I honestly don't think we can. I think that the um, the way that the world is now with everything that we've discussed in this conversation and 
the money and the planning that's behind this, I, I honestly don't think we can. And I know that sounds heartbreaking mm-hmm. and hopeless, um, but I don't think we can. But here's the, here's the positive in all this. Israel doesn't need the support of the US. Israel doesn't need the support of me. You know, Israel doesn't need the world to see the truth. Israel needs to return to God completely. Um, undivided attention to Hashem because he ultimately is the only one that ever saves them and doesn't forsake them. And I think that if we look at the human story, um, God is setting up something here that will bring Israel back into the reality what the world meant for evil, God meant for good. And so I think it's really going to come down to the next few years of us, how quickly this unfolds, realizing that humanity is wicked. Yeah. Like we often think people are born good or I'm good. I'm a, I'm a social justice warrior. I care about, you know, X, Y, and Z people are good. That's a lie. We're not. The only one who is good is God. And the only one who can really bring back this situation will be God. And so I think for Jewish people, the hope is that we need to all be, you know, I said this last night, Hamas brought the nation of Israel together. They've not been this unified in a long time. I've, you know, I've been in Israel all this year before this broke out and um, they were divided, you know, fighting over judicial reforms, fighting over politics, fighting over, you know, crazy things that really aren't relevant when you have people who want to kill you. And so Hamas has been the catalyst that has brought these people back together. But if Hashem isn't the one that keeps them together, there is no victory here. Why do you think this even happened in the first place? Because Israel is known to have the most powerful army in the world, right? I mean, yeah, but it's not about it's, it's not look, about that. No, I look, I say this I, to Jewish people, you know, it's it because there was weakness and no. there was strife within God, 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 Israel God says or Moses pleads with the people of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, his last major speech, as you would call it to this nation. And he pleads with them about what God has presented, what God has done what God has presented, what God has commanded them to do. And he, and he really puts this argument in front of them. He says, Israel, today I present you life and death, blessing and curse. And he says, choose life, choose life. But life is connected to Hashem. If you follow what Hashem does, your enemies, no matter how numerous they are, will run from you. But if you don't, no matter how many and numerous you are, you'll run from your enemies. That's what he said. That's a really, really hard pill to swallow, right? But what we're seeing is that's the truth. I remember having a conversation with two IDF soldiers six years ago in Israel. Really lovely girls. I met them and it was one of the first times I went to Israel and I was talking to them about, you know, my belief in Yeshua as as the Messiah. And I was explaining to them how I understand how everything comes to an end. And I said, a day is coming. I don't know when and what generation, but it's coming where the whole world will turn on Israel and your military will not be the thing that saves you. In fact, your military will be proven to not be strong enough against the enemies that the world is forging against you. And the only person who will be able to save you is Hashem and you're going to be backed up in a corner. In fact, you know, we we hear about this idea in the prophets where they talk about the nations ascending on Israel from the north, gathering to destroy Israel and Israel has no hope until the Lord of hosts, right, comes to win the victory. And I see that's what's happening. And that's why I say you can't stop it. I would, I would love to say that do this, do that. You know, we got to, first of all, approach this reality with degree convincing right. Palestinians, convert all Palestinian radicals to Christianity and they'll all just change their mind and we'll live in peace. It's, it's just not that. And, I, and why do I say this? Because if I say this and it's correct, because God says it and it's correct, then we can trust him. You knew this day was coming, Lord. You knew the enemies were going to rise up against Israel, but you also had a plan. And so we go back to what I talked about earlier in the podcast, when Joseph sees his brothers and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God has something good coming, but it finalizes the brokenness of the human story where the whole world will come to terms and grips with God and God alone is the only one 
who should rule, reign, and be glorified forever. Amen. And so Psalm 2, powerful psalm, right? God says, why do the nations uh, conspire and wage war against myself and Mm -hmm. my anointed one, right? Trying to break off the chains of God. And it says God laughs. He laughs. And he says, I am going to establish my king on my holy mountain, Zion. What's really interesting about that, what God says. He says the nations are conspiring and figuring out a way to overcome God. And then God says, my king is going to be on my holy mountain, Zion. Here's why it's interesting. Hamas, when they attacked Israel 12 days ago, their mission that they claim that they were trying to achieve was to liberate the Temple Mount. Did you know that? No, I didn't. That was what their claim was. We're going to liberate Temple Mount. Alaska Mosque, we're going to set free the people of Palestine by getting the holy mountain. The nations conspire against God and his anointed one. So that holy mountain, God has already said, is the significant part of the story. And who reigns? Who rules? Who wins? This is why, for me as a Christian, you know, the closer we get to the arrival of Mashiach, or in my opinion, the return of Mashiach, right. Jews and true Christians who understand God's word are going to get closer and closer together because we both realize we're waiting for the same person. So you are like, you're a born again Christian, basically. Yes, yes. And so do you go to synagogue or do you I go to, synagogue. or do you go to church? No, I do both. You do both? I have rabbis who are very kind enough to let me sit in and just listen and partake and be a part of their service. And I know maybe there is probably some very, very ultra Orthodox Jews who would see me as the enemy, you know, in their own belief system going, mm. you're trying to steal and corrupt our people with your broken ideology and I don't think false. That. <laughs> maybe yeah, but there is, and that's okay. They're allowed to, right? Um, look, you'll know me by my fruit again. Exactly. Right. And, um, you know, I said to my mum, because she worries, you know, and, and she said, this is, you know, this is really, you know, you got to take a break, Nathaniel. And I said, Mom, there's nobody else. There's no one else that will be willing to lose everything that understands the Jewish people, that isn't a Jewish person who can speak from a place of truth and love that is willing to lose for a nation that's not his own. There's no one else, Mom. There isn't. I wish there was. You just said it right there. That is so powerful. Like, you're not Jewish and you're willing to to risk everything for a, a nation that is not your own. Well, so here's the reality, right? Why do I know that? I believe that Yeshua came and gave up everything so that we could have relationship with God. Yeshua says this. He says there's no greater form of love than one laying down his life for a friend. He says that's the greatest form of love, sacrificial. It's not what I can get from you. It's what I'm willing to give up so that you have life. That's all I'm doing as a Christian. I'm saying the love that Jesus showed me is the love that I must show you now. So before this happened, this horrific, this whole horrific 13 days, what were you doing? Were you, uh, you said you were taking tours of people? tours through Israel. I have a tour next year, which I don't know which will happen. Were you on social? What were you talking about on social media? Just... You know, my love of Jesus and, you know, trying to figure out when this actor's strike will be over so I can go back to work. And so make... you are technically still working as yeah, an actor. Yeah, I hope so. I got, I got a mortgage. <laughs> you know, I don't know how I want to pay my bills in a few months, you know. So when did the show Vampire Diary, when did that show finish? It finished in like 2019. Oh, okay. It was a while ago. Uh, I, and I, I shot a movie in 2019, a shark movie and... A what movie? A shark movie. Shark? Yeah, like uh, was- sharks. I, I was a marine biologist. What was it called? Uh, Deep Blue Sea 3. Don't see it. Okay. Yeah, you, I you think get- I saw that on like one of the yeah. like streaming Yeah, channels. you would have seen it and be like, oh, no, no. This think- would be like a last case scenario movie. You know, um, but yeah, look. I don't know. I don't know. I've just um because when you were like, were you like a sex symbol or heartthrob? Like when and because you did all the Disney stuff and all that. I don't know. I don't. And, I, I wouldn't see myself as a heartthrob. No, but like I, when I saw all the stuff that you did. Yeah, it looks a bit cheesy. And, well, yeah. I think it's like you remind me of like a Zach, like a Zach um, Efron. Yes, yeah, like a Zach right. Efron. Yeah. Like were you like that type of? Oh, you know, I guess I was like you know a vampire on a show, so it was popular. Um, 
Were you like a main character? No, not even, which is amazing. I was I was just a very popular character, very popular, and still am. And I don't, I can't explain that. I guess that's God's sovereignty. You well, know? can it? Did the girls really like you? Because I feel yeah, like when, in some yeah, sense, that's, that's yeah, what I'm saying. So, sense. not to like, I don't want to sh- pivot to that. You know, stuff it's funny. This, I, but I didn't even that, ask you that in, stuff. In the light of all this, you know, I get so many hateful comments on my in my DMs from pro-Palestinian people and people who just hate what I'm saying. And you know, one girl, <laughs> I thought you're ugly. Yeah, you're ugly. <laughs> And I, and I just, I laugh because I was like, yeah, but I have a great personality. And, I, and it's like, I just, you know, like, I'm like, it's before I go to bed, I've had a horrible day and I'm just, my heart's breaking for people. And I just see these comments and I'm just like, you know what? I'm, if this makes me laugh, it might make a couple of Israelis laugh. Like I don't take them very seriously. No, you know? it, but it just like, I but wanted to, yeah. I wanted to ask you these questions. Cause I mean, like, I just, I've, like I said, I became, intro- I, became very familiar with you just very recently right. and so i wanted to know these other questions like what did you do before yeah. like what were you what are we posting about what are you going to do look, later you know it's like because the passion of this for most people yeah will simmer look at yeah of course of course but you'll be fighting the yeah, fight but like here's my this is what's beautiful about separating your passion and your purpose right i think a lot of people don't understand but when when you're a christian and you've really sold out for the truth of who god is you don't really care what the title of your life is. No, no. You don't like, care about like worldly things of like, well, you're going to keep working as an actor or are you going to like have a family or all that stuff, which is all important to these. Do you have the a family? Like, do you have a fat girlfriend? No, nothing? No. Would you, be able, would you be able to be with the girl that's not as Look, here's, hardcore Christian? You no, know, well, you know what's funny? <laughs> or it's do like, you want a Jewish girl? Jewish, right? Like, yeah. here's the dilemma, right? I love Israel so much and I, I, I love Judaism. I know it so well and i you know i you know i have mezuzahs on my door you know what i mean really yeah i just oh, i love it i love it i want to do is i want to be as close to this people as i pos- as i'm possibly allowed you know yeah so i i, I meet these <laughs> i meet these beautiful jewish girls that i could instantly fall in love with and the tragedy is i'm the one person they probably can't date because i'm a christian but at the same time i'm the one who follows their religion more than any boyfriend they'll ever meet trust me i can i can imagine you know? I, I would imagine a couple jewish girls would like to go out with you yeah until they you know trust me I'm, I'm sure you're not gonna have that much of a difficult yeah. time but like for me it's like i've just put all that stuff aside um because especially in light of where i feel like we're at in the human story with yeah. god there's an urgency now to represent him and for me as a christian um I want to bring people into the fullest understanding of who Yeshua presented himself as. Um, and that's my job. That's my goal. You know, if, if I end up with nothing and I lose everything, again, I'll say it. You I've to. already made that deal. You know, I've already made, like, I've already You're okay shaken with hands with God and said, whatever you want. So if you want me to be back in the industry working in Hollywood and I do that, I will glorify your name. If you want me speaking on behalf of this nation, I will glorify your name. If you want me working at Starbucks, serving people their lattes, I will glorify your name. Because I'm not interested in titles or position or status. I'm just interested in being a true representative of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jeez. Wow, Nate, my God. Did I, I mean, did I ask you all my questions? I don't even know. Um, I think I did. Is there anything else you want to talk about no, or say? No, that's, I feel like we, we said everything. Yeah, I guess uh, the one thing I would say is uh, to the Jewish community, uh, if you're watching this. Um, or listening. Yeah, or listening. I want to say uh, from the bottom of my heart and personally that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that, that, that we're here again, uh, that once again, uh, the same evil that has been hidden and under the surface for so long has now presented itself again. And um, I'll never really fully understand what it's like to be hated so deeply just for the identity that you were born into. But um, I will say that, you know, God always raises up people and he will raise up people in your community that will be absolute beacons of light and reminders that you're not forgotten, that you are loved, and that ultimately we are all waiting for that day where I think King David says it best in Psalm 27. He says, I will see the goodness of who you are in the land of the living. And so we have to cling to that hope 
the hope that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had. Because we have to remember, Abraham never really got to experience the fullness of the land. Moses never got to enter the land. And so the people who are in Israel right now, even though they are under extreme heartbreaking circumstances, you are living out God's promise in the land and he will not forsake you. He will not leave you. And he's asking you every single day, start with me, return to me, trust in me because I will deliver you. That's wow. Me. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. You're just, you're just amazing. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on this podcast. I really just adore you. I adore what you're doing. And I, it's so important to have a voice like yours. And, um, I just, am, I'm very grateful for you. Yeah, I really am. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. And you can go home now. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gotta get back in the fight.